to deliver the project to our clients' expectations, it, it takes a pretty robust team of, of people for sure. Business of Architecture, episode 346. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that lets you do your best work more often. Architect Dave Pollard started LiveCo in 2012 to provide quality design to suburban homeowners, but with some twists to the traditional architectural services model. Following on the heels of his graduate thesis work stating, to make architecture more accessible, it's time we stop trying to redesign the building systems and architects lead the charge in rethinking the design systems. This evolved into his design build model, which allows simplified deliverables and a fully integrated and accountable team to deliver the project. Livco, under Dave's leadership, has won numerous awards, including 14 Chicago Remodeling Excellent Awards, four Regional Remodeling Excellent Awards, Home of the Year Award, Contractor of the Year Award, five consecutive years, House Best in Service, Remodeling Big 50, and in 2018, Dave was on the Pro Remodelers 40 Under 40 list. In today's episode, Dave takes us behind the scenes of his design build business model. Dave, welcome back to the Business of Architecture podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Again. So we had you we had you back, according to my records here, on episode 343, and I wanted to have you back on. This is the second half of our interview, but we kind of cut it up because we wanted to dive into a little bit of your, your path as an architect, as an entrepreneur, and how you came to be where you are uh, in the business that you're in. Now, if our listeners want to go back and listen, we did a great segment on video marketing and talked about, that was initially what caught my eye, some of the videos you were doing. You have a really great process for that that we talk about in episode 343. But take us through your journey. Give us the condensed version because we don't have all day, but we do have a bit of time. We want to get into a bit of the details. Yeah, I think uh, I'll, I'll do my best on the condensed version. Um, so what, what I'm doing now is uh, I, I for the last eight years, I, I own LiveCo with a business partner. He is a former home builder. Uh, I'm a former architect or I'm still an architect, but I don't necessarily work for an architecture firm. We together run a design build company. So our model is set up in a way that we we do everything from conceptual design and budgeting all the way through the construction. How I got here, it's not something that I necessarily thought that I would be doing in this model, but I think throughout my career, I, I, I kind of started to understand architectural firm models and how they maybe didn't align with what, what I wanted to do with my life. So I, I changed ships a little bit and help me understand what didn't align um so i graduated from virginia tech architecture in 2003 and the first firm i went to work for was in chicago a uh, fantastic firm and i was excited because they did uh, design build work um, i think i always wanted to be involved in housing in one way or another that was a scale that, that i really appreciated so this firm did some residential, um, but mostly commercial work. Um, and, and I had an internship there and then they hired me full time after school. I was excited about design build, but what I learned is that their model of design build was really a relationship with the general contractor. So a large commercial gen general contractor would do a lot of work for a client doing an industrial building per se, and then they would bring in the architect. Um, and so it was more about maintaining that you know, relationship with the builder than with the end user, which I, I didn't necessarily, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I felt like the first, the first stop in my mind should be the architect and they should be stewarding the, the process. So, um, from there, I, I, I worked there for, for a couple of years. It was a, a fantastic firm. Uh, I learned a lot about design and production and, and the design process. Great people still get together with the partners there. They're still good friends. Um, but I left to, to go work for Optima. Um, and Optima was my dream come true. That is David Hovey's uh, fully vertically integrated uh, architecture, construction, developer, real estate is the whole thing. 100% residential, um, mostly large condominium buildings now, uh, really fantastic projects. It's a des design focused mentality of. Um, 
I think David's always, I've always felt like he's had the sense that if I build it, they will come. I'm tired of developers telling me what the market wants. I'm really good at this. I'm going to build it. Um, and he invented a lot of construction systems over the way to achieve that. Absolutely loved it. Incredible company, uh, a scale that I appreciated from the residential standpoint, really, uh, incredible team of people. I worked for them in, in Chicago and then they moved me out to Arizona and then I think that was 2008, everything started tanking. They had a spot for me in Arizona, but not in Chicago. And I was a little iffy about my wife and I moving to Arizona. So um, a friend of mine brought me to Getch Partners. So I worked at Getch, um, another like fantastic firm. It's kind of like I was, I was going up the line to you know international firm status. Um, and Getch was doing work internationally, so they were very busy. Uh, I learned a lot. It was a lot of glamour, but I didn't take me but a few years to realize it's a, a high rise or a, a hotel lobby in Saudi Arabia was a scale that I just wasn't good at designing. So I don't think my path there was going to be in really design. It was going to be probably more systems based. So I left and I went back to graduate school. So um, I, I quit in a time when um, there actually probably weren't a whole lot of architecture jobs. And I went for a one year full-time master's at IIT. My wife said, just do it. I'm just tired of hearing you talk about it. Just do it. So uh, we went to negative income for a year because my one year tuition cost more than she made in a year. And we lived in our little apartment and I just did one year focus on how architects can actually be involved in, in residential housing in any major way because I think they have a role, but it's really more a luxury role or just kind of the back room of, of, a, of a home builder office. So what I was trying to study was, was if that could be solved through systems. If all the technology that we have in the world today could maybe be leveraged, you know, to make design more efficient. Um, and my, what I found in that was um, maybe the problem isn't the design process, but maybe the architecture firm model was flawed for being able to provide that um, because it, it, it's just too expensive for most people and architects have to battle to say um, it's worth sixty thousand dollars of my time for me to design this for you but the regular person like i don't have sixty thousand dollars to pay you to, to design something you know my take is maybe is there a six thousand dollar solution you know where we can both win um, and at least you get some level of design from it um, so from there, I got hired by, by a developer who was building single family in Libertyville um, as the director of design and hit it off with the director of construction there, who's now my business partner. So that's how we kind of spun into starting Livco. Got it. That makes sense. Um, and just to elaborate on how we're set up now, I think that uh, what I learned, and I always thought that the Optima model, that the design build developer model was the was the simplest path to being able to shape housing um, through a design mentality. But I quickly learned that once I got into the remodeling world, that it's actually a, a continuing to grow industry and a very lucrative industry that is craving what architects can bring to it. So I'm not necessarily going to AIA events, you know, touting that I'm a remodeler. I don't know that that's something that they consider, you know, a high level and not a whole lot of people want to talk to me, but um, I, I'm really proud that we're able to, you know, impact a 15 to 20 families per year through really thoughtful design and spaces for them to live in that most architects wouldn't be able to do because it wouldn't fit their model. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. And I, I, it's funny you mentioned that because I remember early in my career, I knew a company, it was a firm, couple architects banded together and they were, that's what they did. They did interior remodels. That was it. And they had a multi-million dollar company doing that, making tons of money, which was nice, but also just being able to get out there with their hands and, and build cool things and do cool designs. Now, when you say that there's a craving in the market for uh, the, the touch of an architect in these remodeling projects, can you elaborate on that for me? Yeah, I, I think that I, I, had an invaluable education in my five years at Virginia Tech. Um, they taught me in architecture school to basically forget everything you've ever learned. Uh, we're going to start from scratch. 
question, think of everything differently. I don't think that there's very many people in the world that have that experience over five years to have your high school problem solving brain erased and have it recrafted into something that I think is, um, is a, a more successful process for achieving a better end result. So I've always come at it from the stance of give me, so take a new construction, you know, single family home that Pulte or someone's building. Give me that kit of parts. Give me those pieces. Let me rearrange them. Just let me rearrange them. I promise you it will be better. And I'm the cost increase might be 10%. So it kind of the simplest piece of that I feel like a good architectural problem solving uh, training uh, prepares you to just rearrange the pieces in a more thoughtful way for the end user. Um, and and I, th I think that through our projects and the spaces that our clients and their friends come into, I think that they, they, they realize that when they go into them. It doesn't take a whole lot. If you're going to have four windows, you know, let me put them in a place where it matters for direct sunlight and views of the treetops that I'm looking at right now, right? Things of that nature. Yeah. Tell me about the financial side of the of your business model. How is that structured in terms of where does the profit come from? How are the individual players compensated? How does that work? So as a, as a general contractor, um, all of our pricing is lump sum on the construction, just as it would be as if we're a normal general contractor. Um, so we operate that essentially as a, as a construction company, right? So we have margins that are all set up in order to run a construction company. Um, design historically, as we've built the company, we've struggled with understanding what our fees should be. Um, and that might just be some head trash between architecture and construction uh, and trying to understand what we think the market will pay. Um, so I think early on we treated it before we had the portfolio and the team to, to back it up. I think we treated it more as, you know, the bad word loss leader, um, which doesn't necessarily help the architectural profession that we're giving it away for free in order to build. Um, but I think it did allow us to get some, some really good projects and start to start to build a portfolio. So what we've done since then is we have a two-step design process. Um, our first is a flat fee with a range that that's based on the project type. So that's anywhere from $2,500 to $8,500. And that allows us to field measure, develop design concepts, really the meat of the project. And, and the very important part is we're putting together budgeting. So we have real cost data because we build it. I think um, it's hard for most architects to be able to really qualify any budgeting because it's not their fault, but they just honestly don't know how much it costs to build a project because they don't build it every day. So we're able to package that. So I think on that end of it, having construction input in the beginning is a is a pretty important piece of it. We've we've increased our fees enough to be able to run architecture essentially as an uh, its own you know profit center or its its own business. Um, but prior to that, what's kind of nice about when you do have design build and and build is uh, probably an easier thing to sell in a lot of ways because someone's going to have to build it. Um, one thing that, that worked well was our design operation was able to benefit from that profit center that happened in construction. So our marketing budget, you know, our admin, our, all of our overhead costs are really a function of construction while, you know, a regular architect trying to get started um, by himself working out of his home office is, is not really going to have that revenue stream available to support that. So by taking two separate entities and combining those overhead expenses, I think it, it lends a small architecture firm like us to have a larger marketing presence um, and vice versa, right? We kind of share in that. And what's the size of your team right now in terms of uh, people on the design side as well as the construction side, or do you subcontract out a lot of the construction? Help me understand uh, the team dynamics of how you have things structured. Sure. Yeah, so on design, there's four of us. So I oversee um, design. I try to not design too much other than, you know, oversee and help to cultivate our team. Um, and then we have Sarah, who's an architect as well, and she deals with the conceptual front end design. Um, when she, when we complete that first phase of design, it goes to Christopher and Anna. Christopher is our, our design build manager, which is the most 
difficult position um, to be in in some ways. He's kind of the meat grinder. The, the intent of his role is he's translating the concept design into the construction, and he's kind of always has construction yelling at him and then always has design yelling at him. So he's a, he's a good guy. We knew he could handle that. Um, and then he works alongside Anna in that second phase, and Anna is our interior designer. So that design team intent is to start with a conceptual design and then put an entire package together to know everything that's going into this project, to know everything about it so that, number one, we know exactly what it's going to cost, um, and n number two, we can be extremely efficient when we build it. Um, then on the construction so, so this, if I can interrupt there, so it sure. doesn't sound like the model where you're kind of doing just a skeleton set of drawings and investigation and then kind of figuring it out in the field. Are you really locking down the the design, the scope, and everything like that so that then it becomes a lot easier to build? Or how is that working? 100%. Yeah, Got it. That's, okay. Back in the olden days when it was just uh, Russ and me, I think I would probably do a little bit more of a skeleton set and figure out as we go along. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really benefit a whole lot of people. <laughs> So over the years, we've built out an operation with the intent of having that set package. It's really dialed in. Yeah. Yeah. So we know sense. exactly Got what it. it is. Now, now there's going to be details that we figure out in the field and we just sure. are able to, to define that. So we do have a very thin drawing set still. Okay. And probably the scope of work is our most important piece of that. Got it. And then the you said the construction side is structured how? So, yeah. So construction side is five of us. Um, we do subcontract out 99% of the work. So Russ is our construction director, my partner, but in the field, it's really Scott, who's our project manager, and then Tom, who's our site manager, and then we have Denny, who's our field tech. So he's, he's the only one who's really swinging a hammer, um, and then we have two levels of oversight. One is probably 70% office, 30% field. The other one's 30% office, 70% field. And our whole team deals with uh, every every single project. So we, we've learned to deliver to, de to deliver the project to our clients' expectations. It, it takes a pretty robust team of, of people for sure. Yeah. And how's the financial side for you? I mean, making making tons of money, doing okay. Oh, jeez. Um, getting there. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Could we say better. that every year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So our our first quarter this year was the was the best quarter that we ever had and we're feeling really good we've we've invested a lot over the last several years and um, really setting up a budget to build up build up our team um, you know invest in the right people um, invest in defining those processes so that things are flowing through through well so I, I think the last couple of years have been a fair amount of investment a fair amount of learning uh, and then q1 we were like yes we just nailed it and then there was quarter two right and then uh, pandemic. So uh, then everything went crazy on a lead standpoint as of June 1st. And so it's been kind of exciting trying to figure out how, how we can you know, tighten our processes to still have everything 100% defined, but start construction earlier, things of that nature. But um, we're, we're very busy. I, I wouldn't say I'm swimming in money by any means, but I think we're setting up the system to, to make a pretty lucrative, um, successful, and scalable business for sure. Got it. So it sounds like growth is on the horizon. I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, Dave, thanks for joining us today and sharing about your business model here on the Business of Architecture. It's been a great, great conversation. Absolutely, thanks for having me. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.